All right, hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, today's Monday, the day after uh, Duck's Travaganza 2 Battle for the Pond ended. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about that tournament uh, and what I learned and the experience and how everything went. It was a good tournament. Um, it was very well run by the one and only Ted Adams, who is a great human being. Um, I didn't realize going into this. Um, uh, so I'm going to Atlanta for the World Championships of Warhammer uh, because I won Goonhammer. I snuck in uh, in a little tiny GT. Um, and I didn't really know if anybody else I knew was going. I assume some people were, uh, like Scooter and Caleb um, are great players. It was probably safe to assume they were going, <laughs> which they are. Um, but it turns out Ted, uh, Ted Adams is also going. He was um, second place at Summer Slaughter, and um, Caleb was first and had already gotten a ticket to the World Championships, so it then went to Ted, which is awesome. So looking forward to hanging out with, uh, with those folks that I know and meeting a bunch of new folks there. Um, yeah, so we had, I think we had 36 or 38 people. I mean, I guess I could see on the roster. Um, but, uh, it was a decent size. We didn't have to use the overflow space, uh, like we have before in the venue. Um, there were a lot of drops day two, which I'm always disappointed in. I understand like some people like didn't get hotel, like some people don't get hotels and like drive an hour and a half each way for the two days. And then they're not doing well day two and don't feel like coming back, whatever. They just don't feel good. They're sick. Who knows? Whatever. I'm not going to judge, but I do think it's a little lame. I, I feel like there's a little bit more of a culture of dropping. I may have talked about this on the channel before in AOS than there was in fantasy. Um, and that is always disappointing. So we ended up with, we ended up with like, we probably ended up with 29 people at the end of day two, maybe 28. I feel like it was around there. We, so there were a lot of drops, um, like mid tournament. Um, but Regardless, um, it was a lot of fun. I played a bunch of nice people, um, and uh, my result was disappointing, <laughs> but it was a fun tournament. Um, it was disappointing in two ways, one of which was um, I went 2-3, so that was a little worse than I was hoping, um, but it was my first tournament with Cruel Boys, uh, so I knew it was going to be a learning um, experience going against armies that I haven't played before with Cruel Boys, I only had like three games of Cruel Boys under my belt, maybe four before this, like over a year and a half, two year span. So not that many. It's not an army I play much. Um, and I was also playing a suboptimal list. It's not, you know, not really the, the best list you can play with Cruel Boys. Um, and that was mainly because I was hoping to win best painted. So I basically brought all my stuff that was painted and I did not like rush job anything else to make a better list uh, than I had done. And to add to the disappointment, I did not win best painted. Um, I was very sad. Uh, I knew I knew there was a strong possibility that I wouldn't because I didn't have a display board was the main thing. Um, and they did rubric scoring, uh, so they had a they, you know they had a painting rubric. We all judged ourselves, and then the painting judges came around and also judged us. Um, but uh, because of the things on the rubric. Um, I I feel like an asshole saying this, but like I felt like my stuff was the best painted, but there were things there were there were enough things on the rubric that I was missing that it wasn't really possible for me to win. Um, and that is because there were enough there there was enough points between display board, which I didn't have, um, and conversions which I don't really have anything converted in my army. It's just, I painted everything. I, whatever, I, you know, I like, I like games workshop models. Um, they're, they're amazing models. Like I, a lot of times I'm just like, I don't feel like they need to be converted. They're really cool. Um, so all of my stuff in the Cruel Boys army um, is just Cruel Boys out of the box painted as well as I can paint them. And I put a ton of effort into basing this army. So they all have swamp bases with water effects and foliage and plants and mud and rocks and all these sorts of things. Um, so I was hoping something like, you know, that might count for, for enough to make up for nothing being converted, but it did not. 
Um, so I was a little sad about that. <laughs> I was very sad about that, but I'm over it now. Um, we just, you know, we, we carry on. We, we work more on our armies and make them better. Uh, next time I'll have a display board. Um, but yeah, so I, I might do a video at some point, just thoughts about paint scoring and stuff. Um, I had a very, a very good discussion with um, folks in my group uh, on Discord after the tournament, just like, you know, I was venting a little bit my sadness and just discussing like different paint scoring philosophies and judging and the pros and cons of all of that. So I think that would make a good little video. So I'll stop talking about that now. Um, Tom Long uh, won with his Giants, which are very nice. Um, they are super converted and very gritty and grimy and well-painted. Um, so uh, I wish I had taken a better look at them. I've never really, like, I I saw them quickly and, like, at first glance, um, they're, it's, it's one of those, they're one of those paint jobs that, like, looks fairly simple, so it doesn't necessarily catch your eye to take a closer look. Um, like the conversions and stuff are obviously very cool, but like at first glance, they're kind of like very gritty, like almost nighttimey horror grayscale paint jobs, and then like lots of blood effects. So I was just like, oh, that, that looks cool, and like didn't look super close and walked away. And I didn't get a chance to look at him again after he went best painting, but good job to him. I, th I think he's won best painting for those other times too, so I can only be so mad. Um, I also got to talk to one of the, one of the, uh, Knights of the Pond guys, Connor, uh, for the first time, and he's um, he's working on a very nice uh, goblins. Um, gets there we go. <laughs> gets army uh, that looked very cool, and is I don't think even quite done yet. So that'll probably look pretty sweet. He was he had a display board that was in in the process and was already looking good with like some freehand backdrop stuff and like very cool stuff. So looking forward to see how that turns out when it's done. Um, Let's see, other things about the tournament itself. Um, if you've never been to Tables and Towers, it's an awesome place. Most of the people who listen to these videos are my friends, so you probably have. <laughs> uh, but in case anyone listening hasn't, um, Tables and Towers is an amazing venue in Westminster, Maryland. They have a huge space. They have a whole second overflow space. Like They can hold 100-person tournaments there, I think, easily. Um, and they have good terrain, which is nice. They have, you know, they have mats, they have good terrain, they have good tables that are at a height where you're not bending over super far all day. Um, they have chairs at all the tables, like high chairs at all the tables, um, although they're getting a little old and starting to break, <laughs> but it's, it's a nice venue. Um, they had some very cool trophies for the tournament. Uh, so Duck Stravaganza thing, they had these cool duck, um, Trophies for sportsman painted best general and I assume best overall. And then they had some pretty sick uh, trophies. I guess it's a Seraphon guy, an orc, plague bearer, and I don't remember what the death one was um, for best infection. And you can see down at the bottom here, everybody got to take home a smaller 3D printed version of the, the duck trophy. And uh, they're holding another big tournament in May called The Biggest Duckus, <laughs> which is great. Um, and Ted said that everybody needs to paint their their little duck warriors by then. And I don't know if they're going to have a little competition for, for best painted duck warrior or what, but I think it's a cool idea. Um, it was a super cool little, little gift bag thing uh, that everybody got. So that was fun. Um, let's see. Whoops. Um, on to my games, I guess. Like I said, I went 2-3. My first opponent was the one and only Caleb Walters. Um, you can see about 20% of him here. Um, not, you know, his beautiful face, but I'm not a good photographer. So, sorry, Caleb. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I was like, oh, great. I got Caleb Walters, game one, who is in, you know, always, literally always in contention to... Um, win any tournament he goes to. Um, he plays, he's almost always played Zinch, and he's super, super good with it. Um, his list for this was a little different than he normally runs. There we go, Caleb. Um, it was different than the one he normally runs with the Incarnate. Instead of the Incarnate, uh, in this list, he had a unit of six. Uh, where are they? Here we go. 
He had a unit of six Varengard and Fell Spears. Um, obviously, Zinch Mark, because they are in Zinch. Um, so yeah, instead of the Incarnate, he had six Varengard, which I think were awesome. And I think I hate Incarnate, but I think it's a I think it's a cooler addition to the army than the Incarnate, and I think it was really good, and I think like synergized as well with the rest of his list. Uh, so other than that, he had a Lord of Change, a Magist two Magisters, eleven Coalition Bliss Barbs, um, ten Acolytes, ten Acolytes, ten Zangors, three Endless Spells, and of course he was in Guild of Summoners. So he summoned like turn two, another Lord of Change, <laughs> which I was not pleased with. Uh, and he didn't quite get up to summoning the third Lord of Change, but he was close. Um, and if if the game had gone on and I wasn't dead already, you know, he would have gotten to. Um, this was real bad for me. I got stumped, um, which not a surprise, but always unfortunate. Um, part of the problem, I feel like there were two main issues here. Um, this was a bad map to play him on. Um, bad mission. It was a bad mission to play him on. This was Spring the Trap. So you can see this is it's probably after my turn one. Um, let's bring the trap. My cursor, right? Yeah, here we go. Um, I should just pull up all these pictures and paint so I can draw on them. I don't know what I was thinking here. Um, let me pause this real quick. All right, and we're back. This will make me happier because now I can draw <laughs> on these. Uh, so what I was trying to say was that, uh, let's see what will be visible here, maybe red. What I was trying to say is that um, this was Spring the Trap, so my deployment zone was small. So it was like here, it's still very small, hold on. Like, so deployment zone was like, you know, very tiny. It's a little bigger than that. You can see my sticks. Um, and the big issue with that um, is that Zinch with the freaking auto summon an endless spell before the beginning of the game, or I guess at the start of the game, that cannot be unbound for the first battle round. Um, that meant that he put the sigil of Zinch right in front of the middle of my army here. And it was just hitting everything for the first two turns of the first battle round with nothing I could really do about it. And since I wanted, you know, I had to set up my castle, um, I didn't want to be like spreading everything out. So it felt very bad. <laughs> and uh, it also led to things. I mean, it, you know, it just obviously messes up everything. So um, turn one, uh, Sigil went off, and is this bigger? All right, that's a little visible. So turn one, it went off. It did kill a model. So if it kills any model, it summons a chaos spawn. <laughs> so he killed a bolt boy, and he summoned a spawn. I think there is room in this space, like right here. So he summoned a spawn. Um, tying up both of my bolt boy units so that they would have to shoot at the spawn first turn, which was a big pain, obviously. Um, I also completely forgot that, um, forgot that Zinch can steal your endless spells. <laughs> uh, so I summoned the Grave Tide first turn just to like block up some space, hopefully for the Varengard and things like that. Um, and of course on his first turn, he just, this build it, which meant it doesn't go away, it's just his now. So then I had to just build it you know, in my turn to stop it from killing all my guys. <laughs> so it all felt real bad. Um, so luckily, turn one, and I don't think I took notes for this one. Um, I was very disappointed. I forgot my, I forgot my handy note-taking notebook day one. So I was trying to like take notes in my phone, and it just way more of a pain. I don't have notes about all the battle tactics and stuff in this game. It's fine, whatever. Um, you can see turn one, I just spread out a little bit with the um, Hobgrats to get the two side points. Um, I don't think I even took the middle point turn one. Um, I could.
could be wrong. Not sure. Um, I don't know exactly. Yeah, this must have been taken at least after the charge phase of my turn one. Um, so for whatever reason, I had hung back a little bit here um, and not fully gone up. Um, now that I'm thinking about it, I think the answer was I wanted to stay at range of the Varengard charge first turn, at least have one turn without Varengard in my face. Um, you can also see up here at the top, this is my Nash Tooth um, with Fasten. So I had super sneakied him up to here with the thought that if he, uh, if, um, if Caleb took first turn, he would be hidden over here and it would be kind of annoying to have to commit something over there to deal with him. And if he didn't deal with him, he could, the Nash Tooth could like come out and get into his back line later. Um, I was stupid with this. This was definitely not like the right play to do with this guy. Um, so Caleb gave me first turn and I was like, you know what? Like I was just feeling impatient or something. I don't know, but I was like, screw it. Let's just, Fasten this guy all the way over here and get into the bliss barbs. Because, I don't know, I guess I was a little scared of bliss barbs shooting me. Um, and I was like, I think actually the Nash Tube has like a decent shot at like killing most of them. Um, I can't. Um, you know, he has eight two damage attacks. There, there was even a chance that he could, he could just wipe the whole unit. Um, so you can see. And you see, <laughs> um, oh geez, here we go. Uh, I don't know why I'm even bothering. I can just tell you, um, he killed all but three of the bliss barbs, so he did okay. Um, but he did not kill all of them. And then, of course, the other stupid thing about this is that it just gave Caleb a target to kill first turn with all of his magic. So I absolutely should have just stuck with my plan of sitting back here until like my second turn and see if he either commits something over to try and deal with it or if he doesn't I just have this guy sitting in reserve to come in with 20 inches of movement in some later turn to either like take an objective back or kill a magister or something in his back line if he leaves it exposed which Caleb's a good player he probably wouldn't um, but it just would have been a way better plan than what I did um, honestly, even maybe even going into the, the Zangors back here would have been better than the Bliss Barbs, um, just because they are scary in combat and on the charge, and maybe scarier than the Bliss Barbs. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so that was that was a big mistake. Um, casting Grave Tide at all was a big mistake. Turn one, um, and that this thing is just so fucking toxic because you can't do anything about it other than just move away from it. And, like, I just, ugh, I should have, I don't know, maybe I should have. Also, I should have just known that he has it and maybe playing around it better than I did. Um, but we also had, like, you know, this big annoying piece of terrain in the middle of our deployment zones, which I believe, um, I think was impassable. I think we just played these impassable, the big buildings were garrisons, and this was cover area in the corners. Obviously Wildwoods are Wildwoods. He um, did have a moment of like, he was like, wait, are we playing these as woods? Like Wildwoods blocking the line of sight? Like, yeah, <laughs> of course, that's what they are. Um, but he, I don't know, he had thought I had shot something that I didn't turn one. But I was like, no, like I, all of my targets for shooting were because you had a spawn here. And then um, I wanted my, I wanted my, I would have rather had my bigger unit of um, uh, old boys shoot something over here, but they they really only had line of sight over here to these accolades, so I shot them. So yeah, getting back to the summary of the game. <laughs> um, that spawn, he summoned turn one with the sigil. Um, I first shot with the illabo and sadly did not kill it. I think I did like two wounds. Um, so then I shot with a unit of three old boys just to kill it and make sure I could shoot something with the big unit. Um, so I successfully did that. They just killed some acolytes like it was nothing um, super impactful. 
Um, the story of the rest of the game is basically he got his second Lord of Change out, so he, he ended up with two Lords of Change over here, so probably not taking that point back, um, and just did a bunch of damage with this damn sigil that was in the middle of everything um, that I couldn't get rid of. Um, I also had just some absolutely... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I had some I had some absolutely miserable casting or uh, dispel rolls, and um, you know he's inch, so his casting he rolls a five and a two, and that's like a thirteen to cast because they match the highest number on their casting roll. So like the two changes to a five, and then the lords of change are at like plus two, or plus three, or something stupid. So <laughs> you know every casting roll was like a thirteen. Um, but even trying to dispel the endless spells, I rolled, um, what was it? In his turn, whatever happened, whatever the, whatever the order was, I did, I did dispel this at the top of a turn. And then I went to dispel the sigil. Whenever it was, I was dispelling the sigil. Um, Probably should have done that first. Maybe I did. Maybe I did the sigil first. But my first attempt to dispel the sigil, I needed a six. I rolled a two and a one, so I had one primal to throw at it. So I threw primal at it, and I got another two. So I rolled a five on three dice. I didn't sp dispel the sigil that turn, so it had a whole, you know, third or fourth turn or whatever of just blowing everything up and making spawns and being generally obnoxious, which is horrible. Um, I had another, I think my, I think maybe my only other, what was it? Oh, Gobsprax once per game dispel, I rolled a six. Um, and I think I even had a primal or two um, available that I could have boosted it. But like, I think I needed like a 13 or a 14 to dispel whatever he was trying. And I started out rolling a six on three dice. I was like, not going to throw good dice after bad. So it was just like, it was super disappointing. I don't think I dispelled, I might have dispelled one spell all game. It was, it was bad. It was bad. It was bad. I did not dispel anything. Um, I think I may have gotten, I think I may have gotten a couple spells off. Um, but yeah, so, so this was just causing all sorts of problems. I lost most of my bolt boys. Um, to various things before they could really blow anything up. Um, I think I think this was kind of bad positioning on the Sludge Raker. I think he should have been a little further up because with the terrain and like my positioning, once the Varen Guard came down and like got in and started killing things over here. Um, the Sludge Raker wasn't really in a position to help out. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what happened, but the, the Varengard did get down here. They smoked um, Meyer Brute. They, they basically just got into this gap um, and smoked the Meyer Brute, and probably these Bolt Boys should be X. <laughs> We're playing tic-tac-toe here. Uh, and they got Gobsprack with the double fight, I think. And at some point I'd killed four I killed four Varengard, I think, which I was like, yay, killing Varengard, and then over two turns or so of rallying, he rallied three of them back. Which he was stoked about. He was like, ah, oh, this is the best thing about Varengard. You can rally two Varengard back and get you know, whatever. It's like 170 points worth of models back. <laughs> um, it's a lot of points. Um and that was that was kind of the story of the game. Um, the Zangors did get in, uh, maybe down here and kill some stuff. Um, I just, I just, you know, I ran out of models. The, the Varengard got in and killed this chunk of the board, and then the stuff over here. I was just taking damage from the damn sigil for too long, and he eventually got into range where he could start doing things to me because he could see me. Um, yeah, I lost. I lost badly. Uh, I think it was 24 to 8 was the final score. So let's stop talking about that one. Don't save.
Um, game two was against David Ragland. Oh, I'm pronouncing that semi right. Um, of Team Big Chungus. Uh, he was playing Stormcast, which is great with a lot of Annihilators. I love that. I have an Excelsior list. Um, he had an Imperitant, a Relictor with Teleport, obviously, and Drasta. Love any, anybody who takes Andrasta. Laughter in my own heart. Uh, a Knight Arcanum. Then he had 3x5 Vindictors. The Everblaze Comet, which I will talk about. Uh, three Shield Annihilators, and then 4x3 Grand Hammer Annihilators. So going into this, um, I was like, all right, I play... Um, Stormcast, I play Excelsior, like, I know what to do here. Um, I just need to zone out his good uh, Annihilator charges until turn three is over. Whoops, what did I do? Um, yeah, so I just need to zone out the Annihilator charges until turn three, because they all need to come down by turn three, or ideally get to the Lord Peritent somehow and kill him so that they have to come down within nine. Um, and obviously when the Annihilators come down, they do mortals within 10 inches. So also trying to zone out, you know, with the hop routes and things, um, any of my important stuff from taking too much of the AOE mortals. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a game of trying to get out and get enough points and objectives. Um, without opening myself up to some devastating annihilator charges. Um, you can see here, we're, this was on Geomantic Pulse. Um, this was, again, just my inexperience with Cruel Boys. Um, I really didn't, I, I was like, all right, super sneaky, seems real good. I bet there's lots of plays to be made with this. And then um, I felt like there were games where I went in and I was just like, I don't know what I want to super sneaky. It, it's probably good to do something with it, but like I don't know what to do. <laughs> so here you can just see this was this was um, end of deployment. I just I moved some hobgrats up onto a point um, right away just to have something on a point right away. I don't know. I was like I don't know what to do. I'll just move some hobgrats up. Stupid. I probably should have like just sent my fasting guy out here, like way in the back. Um, and then if he wants to commit a unit of four inch move annihilators like way back here to killing him, then that would be fine. I would love a unit of annihilators to be on his backboard edge. Um, or he doesn't deal with it, and then again he can just like this guy can run around and be annoying. Um, yep. Instead, I just did something stupid with five rats. Um, hi, cat. Hi, hi. Uh, my, my cat never will just be consistent about whether he wants to be in the room or not, so he will just like come in and out. I try and shut the door, it's so annoying. Aku, he's big, he's fluffy, he's ridiculous. Um, right, so the rest of this game the story of this game is basically me being dumb about Everblaze Comet and then also him making. A good play with Everblaze Comet. Um, so I did not appreciate how annoying this Endless Spell is. It has 36 inch range, so you can be outside of Unbind range, cast it, and still hit, you know, your opponent's army. And from where it comes down, it does mortals within 10 inches. So essentially 46 inch range with this thing from out of Unbind range is absurd. And it's guaranteed to at least do one mortal to everything in range. So it's a d6. On a 1, it does one mortal wound. On a 2 to a 5, it does d3 mortals. And on a 6, it does d6 mortals. So turn 1, he plopped an Everblaze Comet down right here. And I know he did. He rolled the 6 on the Mire Brute. So he did... And that he rolled double sixes for the Mire Brute. So he did 6 mortals to the Mire Brute right away. But, you know, he did 20 to 25, yeah, yeah, he did, he did, I think he did like 22 mortals across my army, turn one, with Everblaze Comet, 
and then it sits there and gives minus one to cast to wizards nearby. Um, I guess cast and dispel. Um, this would have been far less of a problem if I wasn't an idiot. And in my turn, so he I gave him turn one, but he did that. He, he probably brought um, one unit of annihilators down, did some AoE mortals, and I think failed a charge. He may have even brought two units down and failed both charges, um, the nine inch and the seven inch. Uh, so I was feeling good about that. But then in my turn one, I was real dumb. This is lesson learned. I'll never do this again. Um, I just felt the comment in my turn. So I was just like, oh, I'm scared of the minus one to, I don't want the minus one for all my casts. Like, I want to cast magic. Um, so in the dumbest move ever of all time, I dispelled the comet on my turn one. And then in his turn two, he could summon it again. Um, and of course, what I was thinking was, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move my castle up. Red is suddenly worse and less visible on this map. Here we go. Uh, you know, I'm going to move my castle up. Gobsprack is going to be up here. And so I'm going to be in unbind range. Like, easy peasy. Like, he's not going to get this off again. I'm going to have primals. I'm going to have 3d6 unbind with Gobsprack. It's going to be right. Of course, there's there's a thing that Stormcast has that's very annoying, and that's a prayer that can teleport a unit. So he made a very good play of teleporting his little shitbag wizard. Actually, it might have been the Imperitant with Arcane Tome. But he just teleported his wizard 32 inches away from Gobsprack and all my unbinds and just dropped another comet on my head <laughs> and did like, I don't know, 15 more mortal wounds across my army <laughs> with the Everblaze comet. And I was like, all right, that was, that was a good play. I didn't think about you teleporting away from underbind range. Um, that was awesome. Good job. Uh, noted, do not ever dispel the Everblaze comet in my own turn. It's just stupid. <laughs> so that was a lesson learned. So I took a bunch of mortals from the, the damn comet. If I hadn't taken like 30 plus mortals across my whole army from the comet, I would have won this game. I'm like 90% sure. Um, as it was, I was up um, I was up three points going into turn four, but I just ran out of I ran out of juice before he did. I just ran out of wounds and units. Um, just a little bit before he did, and like I said, like taking taking all those wounds from the comet would have been, um, uh, you know, that would that would have made the difference. Um, in retrospect, it may have been better for me to take first turn and just risk the double, because I can just move up, get in unbind range. You know, he he could still use the prayer to do the same trick, but at least make him use the trick first turn to drop the comet at all and send his wizard way out of position somewhere. Um, and then just, you know, I have enough zoning that I think I can risk the double against the Annihilators. And, you know, they're not always going to be making 9-inch charges, even with rerolls. Um, you're not even always going to make your 7-inch charges, even with rerolls. So I think it, it I think it probably would have been better just to take first, move the castle up into range where I was gonna be able to start doing stuff, zone out with the hobgrots, um, you know, all that good stuff. And then, you know, going into turn two, if he does take the double, I at least get to pick which side the um the pulse comes on. So I think that would have been a better plan. Um, so again, that's just this is, you know this is like my game six of Cruel Boys. I'm still working things out, but a lot of these are concepts that are not army dependent, and I should just know by now. Um, so lessons learned there, uh, including some lessons I should not have needed to learn. Um, I should also say, in terms of opponents, Caleb was great to play. Um, I had never played Caleb before. I played Scooter before, um, so it was good to play Caleb. Um, David was an awesome opponent. I love playing David. Uh, he's a great dude. Um, I would play him again in a heartbeat and be super happy about it. Um, so two good games uh, against good opponents, um, good guys, even though I lost. I'm at this point. And I'm like, all right, 
I'm, I'm way down here in the loser's bracket. I hope I can win game three. Um, this did end up being a lot closer than the game against Caleb. Um, I forget what the score was, but I guess I can look it up real quick. Gosh, failing at clicking. Do, 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 do. Uh, right, so this was a 14 to 6 loss. Um, round one was a 17 to 3 loss. So we're trending in the right direction. Um, I won, so it's so round three. Sorry, spoiler alert, I won round three. Um, round three was against Andrew Martin of the Bridge Trolls, apparently. Um, playing Beasts of Chaos, Dark Walkers, Protect the Herdstone, the Doom Bull, two Ray Shamans, pretty standard setup, uh, two by 10 on Gores, nine Bull Gores, um, which uh, we Jacob was talking a lot about Beasts, Jacob Brandon, um, at the end of the tournament, because he's going to bring them, well, I won't spoil, but he, he wants to play Beasts again. Uh, Thinks that nine Bulgors is a little too much eggs in one basket and a little bit overkill, perhaps. Um, but Andrew had nine Bulgors. He also had six Dragon Ogres and ten Centigors. I have always thought this War Scroll uh, for Centigors looks real cute and that they have play. Um, so I was very happy to see someone bring them out and just see if I'm if I'm right. Uh, they're real fast. You know, they're 14 inch move. They hit okay, especially with the Herdstone up. Um, and they ignore the first two wounds in the combat phase every turn, which seems good. Um, and if things, if they battle shock um, on a two up, you roll a two up for every model that battle shocked, and on a two up, they don't go away. They're just happy. Um, so for 170 points for 20 wounds of that uh, seems legit to me. Um, I like how fast they are, honestly. Um, so that was the list. We were playing on limited resources. So this was the one, um, limited resources is the one where if you can test an objective for two turns in a row, it turns off for you and you can't contest it anymore for the rest of the game. Um, second here, I think I have, let's see. All right, I should have shown this. Just quick flashback. I did have one more picture from the Stormcast game. Um, so you can see here, I'm kind of starting to run out of models a little bit. <laughs> you can see almost all of the gut rippers are gone. Um, I do have three bull boys left here, but I think the unit of six had died. So I'd lost a full 10 man and almost a second 10 man of gut rippers at this point. And my six bolt boys, um, I think the Meyer brute got charged by annihilators and killed before he could do anything. Um, see this guy's back here mainly. I think he was still just zoning out um, annihilator charges back here. So yeah, so I think these annihilators got into Meyer Brute and killed him. I think he also killed Gobstrike this turn. And uh, yeah, like I said, I just ran out of juice a little too fast. The Sludge Raker did some work killing some things, but then he had he had a little bit too much left on points. So like I did clean this up over here. Um I I fought it out okay. Uh, but back to the game. I only have one picture from the Beastman game. Um, much like the game against Stormcast, this was very much a game of trying to zone things out and not get my important stuff charged by things coming from off the board. So very similar concepts to, um, to the Stormcast, but obviously it happens differently with the Beastmen. Um, at this point in the game, so I had deployed, let's see, get my paintbrush out again. At this point in the game, um, at the start of the game, I had basically castled up here in this corner. Um, you can see the objectives. This is one where they're kind of going across um, diagonally on both sides. Um, I castled everything up here. 
And then I had, he started with just like, he started with like Ungors here and maybe a Shaman here uh, on the board. So I had deployed the this guy, the Nash Tooth. There we go. I started the Nash Tooth like up here or behind here, somewhere, somewhere up in this corner. So once again, just kind of doing the thing of like, this guy's going to be way far away. He can move 20 inches one turn if he wants with Fasten. And if you want to commit something way up here to get him, I'm kind of happy that it's way up there and not dealing with the rest of my army. So just trying to split people's attention with, with this guy. I'm, I went two and three. So is that a good plan? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, probably not. Um, but you can see, I, I did take this objective up here early, um, thinking it was okay for me to burn that one early in the game um, because the rest of my army can get to the ones on this side um, or even down to here, just, you know, Burn the furthest objective from the rest of my stuff early. I figured it was a good plan. Um, I forgot all game this game, much to my dismay later, that uh, I'm not visible outside of 12 inches. So, you know, the whole point of playing Crooning Blades, uh, I totally forgot. So um, you can see I I was moving. Where are these? Um, you can see I was just moving up the castle and trying to zone things out. So I had, oh, it's not here, right. The kill bow was down here and got killed by the doom bull because I was using the kill bow to zone out um, from seven inches for the bulgors down here and nine inches from board edge for other things coming in. Uh, these three had been garrisoned in this building in the corner here for a while. Um, and this point in the picture is after the Bulgars had come in. So you can see there's one Bulgar left here. Um, so, so at this point, I had, I'd said, all right, the, the Bulgars are out, the Dragon Ogres are out, and the Centigors are out. So I don't have to worry about zoning everything out at this point in the game. So, so everything's moving up uh, in this picture you see here. Um, this was a very close game. The points ended up being 20 to 15 me. Um, I, the Bulgars did even, I, uh, you can see, obviously you can see, I managed to kill the Bulgars, but they did even more than I thought they did. Um, so essentially what happened was I had 10 Hobgrats and then I had, Sludge Raker was like back here at that point, I think still, um, but then I had, this is 10 gut rippers. I had another 10 gut rippers here. And then I had like the six bold boys here. So what happened was, I thought, you know, I thought the, the Hobgrot screen was good for a turn to keep the Bulgors away from this stuff. Uh, but what happened was, I think in magic phase, I think in the magic phase, he did two wounds to the Hobgrats. Maybe something shot at them, but I don't, I don't think he had any shooting. I think, whatever. In some manner, he did two wounds to the Hobgrats here. So there were eight left. So what he did, of course, was he brought the Bulgors on here, and they charged, and they killed all eight Hobgrats with their impact mortals. Um, and that was actually his tactic for the turn was he needed to kill things in the charge phase with mortal wounds. So it's a, it's a beastman tactic. Um, so when he had to, you know, when he killed two in whatever it was shooting or magic phase, he was like, all right, I, I can, I can do this. <laughs> and it turns out I didn't know this. Um, he actually did roll. I think he rolled three ones, the first roll. And so he didn't kill them. But I didn't realize the Doom, or not do I keep calling them Doobles, the Bulgore um, Standard Bearer lets them re-roll their mortal impact hits roll. So he just re-rolled it and you know killed killed all of the Hobgrats. And then, so, so he charged in, he was here. Then the Doom Bull did the start of combat phase charge thing. For some reason, I didn't, in my head, you I don't know. For some reason, I had in my head, like, you can't charge twice in the same turn. So, like, if he charged in the real charge phase, you wouldn't be able to use it 
in the combat phase. Obviously, I was wrong, <laughs> I guess. Um, there's no such restriction, as far as I'm aware. Uh, so, so I was not prepared for the possibility that if he killed this Hobgrot screen, he could come into the side here and pick up both the Gut Rippas and the um, Bolt Boys, which he did. So knowing that now, I could have... Um, oop. So like I had the Bolt Boys here. I could have just wrapped around the Gut Rippas more so that even with the um, combat phase charge, he, he wouldn't be able to get to the Bolt Boys. So that, that's just a lesson learned. Um, the Bulgors, especially with the nine, I think I've only played against unit of six. So I did, yeah, I just wasn't even thinking like he could just wipe my screen and then charge a second time. It, it just wasn't in my head. That's the thing he was going to do. Um, but luckily, um, cruel boys do a hell of a lot of damage. <laughs> so um, I believe I believe these three bolt boys shot a few off. And then um, Sludge Raker went in and killed a bunch. Uh, I was planning to have the Sludge Raker and the Mirebrute both go in and be able to do the Cruel Boys Wog and pick up the, the whole unit. Um, but the Mirebrute failed to charge. And then it turned out that the Sludge Raker just went off and killed almost all of them himself. So. Um, when, when I didn't make both charges, I was very worried that the Sludge Raker would die back, but I killed enough that, that I didn't. Um, so yeah, that was good. Um, the big rule that I messed up to my detriment of my own is, like I said earlier, I forgot that I'm not visible outside of 12 inches. So basically what happened was Gobsprack was sitting here behind this Scrollboy screen. Um, he had brought the Dragon Ogres in like up here, I think. Um, he had a shaman up here, and he was like, ah, the, you know, my shaman has 18 inch range on these heroic actions. So he did the pull on Gobsprack, and he rolled like a nine, which was enough to pull him all the way over the Hobgrat screen. But of course, Gobsprack wasn't visible to the shaman. So he was outside of 12 inches, which I was like, I was like, ah. Oh, don't you have to be within whatever? I don't know. I asked something about 12 inches, and that didn't trigger my memory that he couldn't even see him. So I was like, oh, I thought it was 12 inch range or something. And then he was like, no, it's 18. And I was like, all right, cool. He pulled Gobsprack. So, so he pulled Gobsprack over here, and Gobsprack got eaten by Dragon Ogres, um, which sucked, <laughs> obviously. Um, and then he may have gotten the double. No, I think it was just his next turn. He sent the Dragon Ogres in here, and something very funny happened, which I'll talk about in a second. He sent the Centigors up and killed the uh, Nash Tooth up there, which is fine. Um, he, let's see, I cleaned up this. I think I killed the Doomble with shooting, but I'm not positive. Um, but what happened with the Dragon Ogres is, um, so they came in here, they were kind of blocked up by the Grave Tide, but he was able to get, um, whatever, whatever happened, he, he allocated whatever he could into the Gut Rippers, and that meant he only killed... Four Hobgrots, or five Hobgrots. He killed five Hobgrots with whatever he allocated into them. He probably rolled, sounds like he rolled poorly. Um, and then, since, right, so I lost five to the Dragon Ogres of the Hobgrots, four more Battle Shocked off. So I had just the musician sitting up here. So in my turn, he just retreated and was like, I'm going to go stand next to the Herdstone and deny your grand strategy. So. Good job, single Hobgrot, for, for living through that. Um, he did, I think the Dragon Ogres did clear a lot, or all, or most of the Gut Rippas, but um, between them attacking back and shooting, and the Meyer Brute went in, um, I pretty much cleaned up the Dragon Ogres. Um, so, 
there was there were there were two things at the end. So he <laughs> he um he started drinking partway through the game, pretty early in the game. So by the end of the game, he was like, I don't know, halfway through a bottle of wine or something. So it's probably affected the battle tactics um, at the end a little bit. Um, so there was one thing that, I mean, it was kind of two things. Um, we're both slightly messed up. So my sled drinker had gone over here to get this point because there were these... Ungors, he had summoned a second unit of Ungors with the Brave Last Trumpet. Um, so I charged in the Sledge Raker, I stomped this Shaman to death, and he then activated and retreated with an Ungor unit, because they can do that. And I think my Sledge Raker just wiped the, the other Ungors. So he got everything here. Um, he picked, I think, his fourth round. Um, he picked the tactic where he needed to take this back from me. So he was like, all right. He was like, my tactic is I need to take this back from you with the Senegors, basically. So I was like, cool. All right, fine, whatever. Um, so he charged the Senegors down. And my Sledge Raker was very hurt at this point. I think he had nine wounds on him. He had five left. So I was like, I was like, all right. If you, you know, you need to, you said you need to take this point from me with the Senegors. My only hope of denying your tactic is if, like, somehow my Sledge Raker lives and kills five back, which 10 wounds, that's, if I live, it's not that unlikely. So, so thinking that, I like made the decision to roar him so he at least couldn't get all out attack. Um, he attacked me, he killed the Sledge Raker. I was like, all right, I was picking up the as I was picking up the Sledge Raker, I was like, cool, you know, tactic, whatever, blah blah blah. And I, well, light bulb went off in the back of my head, and I was like, wait, isn't this the Beastman tactic from the book that you need to take back an objective with a unit that has 10 models in it? So, oh, yeah. He was like, yeah. You didn't really, you didn't really say, like, you didn't really explain the tactic all the way because it's a really obvious choice. There's 10 Sendigors here. It's a really obvious choice to just stomp them uh, and try to kill one and just make him fail without a before he can attack. So I was like, I was kind of like, oh, this is going to feel like a real dick move. But I was like, dude, like if you had explained what actually what the battle tactic was, like I would have just stomped you. Like, do you mind if I, mind if I just say I stomped you? Like I would have if you had explained. And he was like, uh, yeah. he, he obviously... I was like, no, I didn't, don't really want you to do that. Like, we've already made the decision. But I was like, I was like, dude, like you didn't, you didn't give me the information. Like, this is a super obvious choice. Let's let me just roll it and see. And like, I did roll it. I killed it. And like, I asked, I asked, I asked a guy or two at the bar afterwards. I was like, was this a dick move? And the one guy was like, yeah. Somebody in my group was like, no, that sounds reasonable. So. Up in the air, Andrew. I'm sorry. I, I still feel a little bit bad about bad about it. Um, I still would have won the game. I still would have, you know, I would have won by three instead of five. Um, so at least it didn't change that outcome. Um, and also, as I'll talk about in a minute, he got a battle tactic turn five that he shouldn't have. <laughs> um, but um, so yeah, it was just I was like, if I just if I just remembered and put the two and two together, what battle tactic it was myself. Earlier, it wouldn't have mattered, but also it would have been nice if he did fully explain the battle tactic. Um, so I don't feel too bad about it, but just not an ideal situation. Um, whatever, it happens. Um, so, so yeah, the Senegors were down here and did not pick up that battle tactic. And then the one that he messed up um that he shouldn't have gotten so so we'll just say it evens out he shouldn't have gotten his turn five tactic even and then you know if if he got that and i didn't take back seize the the stomp thing it would have ended up the same so so what happened turn five um he had with the dark walker's power um well these guys were dead but the the brave last trumpet unit of gores he teleported and brought back on the board back here um and Really, I think, you know, a grand strat's worth more than a tactic. I think he should have just charged my one hop rat and killed him. But what he did turn five is he did the tactic um, to, as he explained it to me, 
have two units in cover, fully in cover. Um, so you move the Ungors over here onto this piece of cover terrain. You move the Centigors over here onto this piece of cover terrain. It's like, cool, I got my turn play battle tactic. Like, great. Doing my little tournament, you know, rules review afterwards today. Um, I read it again and I was like, oh, actually both of the both the pieces of terrain need to be wholly outside of your territory. So on this scenario, your territory goes all the way up here. So the Ungors being on this doesn't doesn't count. Would have failed the battle tactic. Um, and he had actually teleported them over here the turn before. So I think he was waffling on whether to deal with uh, the Grand Strat thing with the Hopgrot or whatever. So, you know, he, if he had been thinking ahead, he, he still probably could have gotten it by sending the Centigors here. And instead of popping the Ungors back over here, um, send them over. Although that's impassable, he would have had to pop them back up here, turn four, and then garrison them. Um, I probably could have killed them. Not sure. Anyway, moral of the story is those two things, at least in the grand karma of the world, even out um, to the same score. So hooray. Um, it's a good guy to play. Andrew, cheers. Um, hopefully no hard feelings. That was day one. Um, so at least I got a win. Hooray. <laughs> I'm not feeling quite as bad about myself. Uh, and then day two... Um, I don't know. Well, okay, I do know why. Day two, I got matched into Nick um, with his Iron Jaws, who I've played before, um, Nick Grimner from Team Big Chungus. Um, so this is the same list I played against uh, when he had it at Nova uh, with my OBR. Um, I've played against Iron Jaws so many times at this point, I was like, all right, I kind of know the score here and, and what to do. Um, I did lose, so like <laughs> I didn't execute what I needed to do, but I knew the general gist. Um, so he's got three war chanters, um, mega boss, a mall crusher, two shamans, ten brutes, two by six core grunters, full beans. Uh, it's a Ooh, it's actually more drops than me, right? So I made him go first, and he just kind of moved up, being KG, didn't commit turn one, which was the correct answer. Um, this was on, I do have notes from day two, right, this was on Fountains of Frost. So again, another scenario that kind of messes up me making my little Cruel Boys castle. Um, it was very annoying trying to move up the castle and like keep things off of the objectives so that they didn't blow up in my face. One turn I just risked it and had three things on. Uh, and luckily, he didn't roll the four up, so nobody took wounds. So it turned out fine. Um, I just got to take risks like that. Um, I didn't take pictures of this one. But, you know, the moral of the story was I tried to keep him from doing the Iron Jaws thing, and he did the Iron Jaws thing. <laughs> I got um, turn one, the way he moved up, he did leave. Um, sorry, background. We were both real brain dead for this game one on Sunday. I was trying to leave the house, and I was like, I can't find my phone. I was looking all over the house for my phone for like three minutes, where I realized my phone was in my pocket. So like, <laughs> I was off to a great start for the day. I told him, I was like, hey man, this is where my head's at today, this morning. He was like, yeah, I feel about the same way. So we were both like, just, we, we were both making a couple stupid decisions and like, you know, telling each other to not be dumb and sometimes letting each other be dumb. Because it can't be too nice when you're competing and like, you know, we were we were both just <laughs> running a little rough in the morning. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, he he kind of left two war chanters out in the open turn one. We're getting um, that I'd said I had fastened on the Nash tube, so like I got the Nash tube up. Um, turn one into one of them and like piled into the other and. I think I, I think I forgot that I was planning to finest hour him when I went in to try and like make sure I killed both. Um, so I ended up just focusing the one down. Um, so I focused down the one, and then I believe right he won the priority roll turn two and gave me the double. 
because he knew that I was not like set up to have a good double turn. But that did mean I got to find a sour than Ash Troop again, and he fucking failed to kill the other damn war chanter. So he still had the second war chanter on that side of the board to give um, violent fury to the second unit of Gruntas. Um, I killed the I killed the ten brutes in my turn two because he had he had gorked them up, killed he you know they ate the mire brute Trogoth who I kind of had off to the side not in the castle. Um, and stupidly not standing on a point to deny him five points first turn. It was real dumb. Um, so, like, I killed the brutes, killed pigs, but um, the other big mistake I made was my screen on my left flank. Um, I had you know, I had the double screen. I had Hobgrats, I had Gut Rivers behind it, I had my castle behind that, my Bolt Boys, all those guys. Um, and I just stupidly left. You know, when I moved up that turn, turn two, I was just like stupidly not paying enough attention, and I left my gut rippers within two inches of the front of the hobgrats. So he got to charge in and do all of his two inch range attacks onto the gut rippers behind the hobgrats, thus defeating the entire purpose of the double screen. And it was just dumb. And so he killed both of those units with the uh, Gorgrantos, and that meant. He got to make a normal move afterwards because he wasn't wasn't in combat anymore. So he just moved back out of my range again, and I was like, "That's that's kind of the game right there." <laughs> so then you know they came back in, the ball crush came in, and it was it was a mess. Um, but it was nice to play Nick again. Um, so I'm winning three at this point, and then um, game five was against JC. Um, who was awesome. Um, she is very new to the game. So this was probably like you know, game five of the tournament. This was probably her eighth game of Age of Sigmar, I think she said. Um, so, you know, I, I said like at the start of this, like this was kind of a learning tournament for me with the Cruel Boys. Um, this was a thousand percent more a learning tournament for her than it was for me. Uh, and she was playing Bl- Blades of Corn, which I was like, it's not a beginner-friendly army. Like Blades of Corn are super te- technical, um, but she was like super good about you know making sure she had all the rules right and was doing all the right things and you know like wanted me to explain all my tactics and stuff to like learn the Crow Boys army and all that good things. Uh, so definitely an absolute pleasure to play her and have a nice um, game five. Um, this was on every step forward. Um, the the retreating not counting on a point thing did come up once um, and lost me a point, but I did end up winning, um, which someone that knew, like, <laughs> I would have been sad if I didn't. Um, so, like, it was kind of expected, but it was a super fun game. It was a super nice game. Um, so... Here you can see, let's see, did I have Hobgrats down on the left? Yeah, so I definitely had Hobgrats down off screen here um, in that little zone. She had Flesh Hounds up here in the little strip you can deploy it up there. And then her list was Scarbrand, uh, the Wrath of Corn Bloodthirster, and the Unfettered Fury Bloodthirster, the scary trio of Bloodthirsters, um, a Bloodmaster, and a Slaughter Priest. Then 20 blood letters, 2 by 5 flesh hounds, a skull cannon, the hex gorgeous skulls, excuse me, and the skull altar. And this was in, oh, this was in Reapers of Vengeance. I thought it was in, I thought it was in the other one. Anyway, um, so, where did my pink go? There we go. Um, right, so... This was one other thing about this tournament. They, um, half the tables had two Wildwoods in the center, and the other half had two Impassable in the center. And I played like almost exclusively on the tables with the Wildwoods in the middle up until this game. Um, I think that hurt me a little bit in the earlier rounds. It felt much better to have these Impassable terrain in the middle where I could move my castle up and use the impassable to like screen off part of the castle. Um, so I had Hobgrats, I had a layer of Hobgrats, a layer of Gut Rippers, 
the three bolt boys there. Down here, I was like, I think just one layer of gut rippers is enough because I know at least for tur first turn, she couldn't get to me coming that way. Um, six bolt boys, two shamans are in here, everything else but the hot rats over here, and then these little two guys down here. Um, I didn't really, I didn't super sneak it. Sneaky anything. I thought about throwing, once again, um, this guy like way in the backfield. And then I was like, wait, no. <laughs> if you if she just goes and kills him, um, it'll be a blood tithe. So why throw him away? So I just kept everything together. Um, yeah, the moral of the story on this one was me just like moving up onto the points and just going <laughs> with bolt boys <laughs> and killing all the poor corn models. Um, I rolled like, there were, there were, like, there were a few times this, this weekend where I rolled real hot with like the bold boys and stuff. Um, I, I see the, um, I see how cool boys can pop off. Um, so I, I did give her first turn. Um, she was not really set up to do a tactic, so tried to do intimidate, um, so she she got the blood um, letters very far up here, but not quite out of her deployment zone. Um, these ran, but actually where they were, they like didn't quite have the distance to get out of her territory there either. Um, and I asked, I was like, I was like, like, do you want like re realizing that intimidate really wasn't going to work out this turn? I was like, if you if you want to take another another tactic, like that would be fine. Um, but she said nope like this learning thing like gotta gotta learn um which is a great attitude to have um i have done the same thing a couple times myself of like nope <laughs> I, I gotta be punished for this because otherwise i won't learn uh so props to that uh for that um so yeah so the flesh hounds moved up the scar brand here and the blood letters moved down there um things moved up here so the other the other bloodthirsters and the other flesh hounds moved up, gone that way. Um, I think I have a couple more pictures for this one. Let's see what this is. Right, so here at least you can see. Um, I set the hobgrass up on the strip because there was this giant garrison here. And um, now that I'm, I thought about it later in the game, I was like, actually, I think, I think it's pretty standard to not have garrisons within six inches of an objective, so you can't hop into it and contest the objective. Um, which was completely what my plan was here. Um, so instead of doing that, I just because of that reason, rather than like resetting the terrain or anything, I just moved them um, onto the point instead of like garrisoning. Um, so let's see. I, yeah. Moral of the story was she moved up first turn. I killed the flesh rippers over here. Or flesh hounds, the flesh hounds. There we go. Killed the flesh hounds over there, uh, and moved up onto this point. I moved up a little bit onto this point, but like just kind of towing it, trying to stay far enough away from Scarbrand and the blood letters. Um, so like these two kind of just moved up like right here. Um, in fact, they almost. I think they might have just. Yeah, yeah. They basically just moved up there. Um, I just stood still and shot from 24 with these guys and did a bunch of wounds to, I think I did eight wounds. No, I shot, I shot the, um, I shot the blood letters. I think I was within 15 of them. I think I moved and was within 15 of them. So I killed like, killed something stupid, like seven or eight blood letters with shooting. Um, I gave her turn two. Um, she got the charge with the blood letters onto the screening gut rippers. I unleashed hell and killed like four or five more. <laughs> it was gross. Um, and she failed the 3d6. I think she needed an 11 um, to get over here with Scarbrand and charge them. Um, so that's you know that's what I was hoping would happen. I was like. I think you're far enough away that I don't need to worry about Scarbrand too much. And if you did get in, like, he probably blows up one thing real hard. I, maybe he would have gotten two things. I was hoping I was spaced enough that he wouldn't kill everything. 
Um, but he failed the charge, so that was fine. Um, I, I think it was like an 11 or 12. So it was like, it was a, it was a very makeable 3d6 charge. Um, I had reason to be worried. Um, and from there, I, let's see, I'll open the other picture I got. Uh, out. So from there, you can see I, you know, I pretty much killed everything. This is bottom, this is after bottom of three, I think. So this is going to turn four. So I... I got a little bit greedy, so I had cleared the blood letters, and then um, I guess the blood letters killed. Looks like they killed all of the gut rippers, um, but the sludge raker I think went in and cleared, cleaned them up, and then ah, I remember what happened. Right, so there were some blood letters left. Um, like Hirish, not the right, so red and big. Um, there was like two or three, no, there was one blood letter left. I think there was one blood letter left right here. Um, I charged the sludge raker in that turn, and then I charged the Nash tooth. Scarbrand was like over here. I charged the Nash tooth and the Meyer brute into Scarbrand. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do the cruel boys wog so I can pop Scarbrand. Um, he had eight wounds left. So I'd done eight. He had eight left. Um, so I was like, I'll pop the wog so I can kill Scarbrand before he can strike and kill my dudes. Um, and that was like the plan for the turn. And then I was like, you know, I was like, I am actually kind of close to the skull cannon. I was like, with eight wounds on Scarbrand, I had, I think I had finest houred the Nashtooth. I was like, I think the Nashtooth can just kill Scarbrand himself. And I was like, the Bolt Boys can charge in and kill this one Bloodletter, and then my my Snatcher Boss can pile this way and maybe get the Skull Cannon this turn. And I like, I, I like slightly, I, I measured it and was like, it's it's very close to six inches. So I was like, I can be greedy and go for, you know, go for the sneaky play where I, I free up the Snatch Boss. These guys. So I picked, you know, I activated the Wog. I picked him. I picked the Bolt Boys. And I picked the Nash Tooth. And um, of course, what happened was um, I did kill the Bloodletter, but the Nash Tooth did not kill Scarbrand. So I was like, crap. So Scarbrand smashed the, um, he smashed the Meyer Brute because the Meyer Brute hadn't gone yet. Um, so she made a good choice there. Um, I was like, crap. Now, now Scarborough's going to like eat my whole army. Oh no. <laughs> so I had a moment of like, this is stupid. Um, and it was very stupid because uh, upon measuring more carefully, I piled three inches with the Sludge Raker towards the Skull Cannon, and I wasn't actually quite within three to fight. I was like, that was pointless. Alas. <laughs> um, so then the next turn, luckily, I believe I got the double there. Um, so the next turn, um, she used uh, Apoplectic Frenzy, whatever the Blood Tides Roar is where you can have something fight. So Scarbrand fought in my hero phase and killed the Nash Tooth, um, which was sad. But it was nice that Scarbrand got to do some Scarbrand things. And, uh, you know, then I just I shot Scarbrand to death. With those, I believe, I charged in... Um, this was this was led into the maelstrom, so I, I charged in the sludge raker here. There were flesh hounds here, also at that time. So I figured I can kill the flesh hounds and then still be in combat with the skull cannon that I'm not scared of. Um, and there was the other bloodthirster was here. So for led into the maelstrom, I charged in the gut rippers into that bloodthirster. I believe it had um, had some wounds on it. I think I had like six or seven wounds left. So I was like, there's a like there's a decent chance the gut rippers just kill it. Um I might have had like ten or eleven left. I don't know. Whatever. I was like, there's a decent there was there was like a good chance the gut rippers kill it, but not guaranteed. Um I'll talk about the outcome of that in a second. I just want to also note one thing about it. This little hobgrat um had 
retreated and I think it retreated from something and then I think there wasn't anything else in the whatever. It mattered or we talked about the fact that like this guy wouldn't count because he retreated um, on that point. I forget if it ended up mattering. I might have I think I was thinking that if I shot off the bloodthirster here, then I still wouldn't take it back at that time because he didn't count that term. So I, th I think that's what I was thinking. Um, but regardless, um, sometimes cruel boy things happen. So you can see there's five well gut rippers here. Um, they are within 12 of the natural boss, and I did give them poison. That's what this little marker is. And uh, my role attacking the bloodthirster is this. <laughs> so I did 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 13, 14 mortal wounds to the bloodthirster, which even if it was a full health, it would have just smoked it right out. Um, so yeah, sometimes you roll a bunch of sixes with the cruel boys and things happen like that, uh, which is fun. Um, so yeah, so then um, after that turn, um, she just said, let's call it there. We can talk it out. Like we don't need to roll any more dice. Like she was out of models basically. Um, so I, out my grand strat of killing everything. Um, Crumple Mall overall was probably the bad. Not I don't. I I'm still conflicted over the grand strat. Um, it obviously only worked out for me in two games. I only got my grand strat in two games, and they were the ones I won. Which like I said going into this in the prep video, like this is a win more strat. <laughs> if I'm I'm blowing everything off the board, I'll get it. And I'll win. If I'm not winning, like I'm not gonna get it. So that turned out exactly as expected. Um let's see. Yeah, it was a great fifth game. Um JC ended up winning best sportsman. Um I was super conflicted between voting. It was a it was a voting thing. You voted for your best opponent. I was very conflicted between voting for her or voting for David um from day one. And I think it was just recency bias pushed it over the edge, because um, they were both fantastic to play, very, very nice people. Um, yeah, so this was a good game. Um, let's see. Uh, I ended up, like I said, going 2-3, which put me in 24th, um, which was barely ahead of Emma, who only played three games. <laughs> So Emma was two and one. It was twenty eighth. I played all five of my games and was twenty fourth. Um, so you know, could have been worse. I could have been below Emma with only three games. <laughs> um, you can see down here. You can see the number of people that that dropped and only had three games, or even um, Mike Vaginos dropped after four games. He dropped after game one on um, Sunday because he was two two and like wanted to go watch football or something, which I thought was super dumb. Sorry. Um, but I was like, just, I don't know, just play the fifth game. Playing this all shark list too. Um, but I don't know, I guess you came, you come to win and then you're two, two and you're like, you go watch football, whatever. I don't agree. We don't judge you though. Um, other placements. So Caleb did end up coming in first. So I got smoked by the, the winner. That's fine. Um, his brother Scooter came in second. Um, so I believe, I think, I think they kind of best general is first place and then, uh, Scooter got overall third place was rank with the disgusting, um, gunstock list, um, with the two by 15 thunders and gun haulers and looks like he did real well other than getting absolutely blown up by iron jaws, I think in three. Um, Skaven came in fourth. That's great. I didn't really get a chance to see this army. Jeremy with the Suns came in fifth. Jacob was playing Fire Slayers randomly. Uh, came in sixth. Um, mainly just what I wanted to point out is once again, just like Nova, the absolute wonderful um, diversity of factions in the top ten. Um, so this is a smaller tournament, but still the top ten had, I think, no repeat factions in it. So Zinch, Iron Jaws, KO, Skaven, Suns, Fire Slayers, OBR, Heed Knights, Agatkin, Sylvaneth, Seraphon. Oh, and then we finally 
we're finally repeating down here, 11th, 12th place, Seraphon. And we get yet another faction with the Gits. Just good job getting to workshop. The meta, it's great, I think. Um, AOS is balanced, hooray. Um, last thing I will say before my voice completely gives out <laughs> is that um, at Nova, um, you know, if you use the Warhammer app, you're using your phone all the time while you are playing your games. At Nova, my phone was like super out of battery, um, end of day one or end of end of Saturday. And Josh Hankin, the man, the legend himself, um, he's just an awesome dude uh, from within Boston. If you've never met him, uh, you should hope you get a chance to play him and hang out sometime because uh, he's great. Let me use his little portable portable battery thing to charge my phone up and not have a dead phone. So I bought myself a little portable battery thing, not a phone, this is a battery, um, offline for like 20 bucks. And this was an absolute just freaking amazing purchase for my, my tournament bag. Um, so yeah, I, I think I was like, I think it was like turn two of game two and my phone was at like 25% battery. So I just plug it right in and had battery for the whole weekend. It was great. Um, so yeah, great addition to the tournament bag. If you ever feel like picking that up, I know I have friends who have had dead phones during tournaments and had to use their opponents phones to like look up rules and stuff. So like, this is a great purchase. Um, and if you're ever at a tournament with me and your phone's dead, I think I'll have this with me all the time. Um, although I did forget my notebook. So my, my tournament bag was not fully ready this weekend. Um, but yeah, um, this fun weekend. I am looking forward to making it a display base and hopefully <laughs> taking Best Painted at some point with Micro Boys. Um, I guess I might have to convert something too. Um, yeah, I'll talk about that more if I do a painting video. But thank you all for listening. It was a good time. Props again to Ted and the Ducks, the Knights of the Pond, for putting on this tournament. I uh, look forward to you playing again soon.